the Fantasy Six Pack Hour with your hosts, Joe Bob. Ah, uh, you're awful. And AJ Applegar. It's Sin Shu Sin Shu Chu. It's a mouthful. All right, all right. Welcome back to the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. My name is Joe Bond, founder of FantasySixPack.net. With me as usual, AJ Epigarth. What's up, bro? What's up? Still Hi. staying six feet away from everybody, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> Including your wife and kids? <laughs> yeah, for the most part. <laughs> I'm in the oh, if, most of the day, so. If only we could, sometimes. No, all good, man. Um, all right, so tonight's show, it's a good one. We're going to talk about some NFL pr- prospects, um, about the you know their best fit in the draft, not necessarily where they're going to go or you know mock draft type of thing, but just you know if you know where they where a good fit for them based on team needs and you know initial playing time that kind of stuff. Uh, and fit into the offense would be for them. So we'll get into that for sure. First, though, man, I want to talk to you about this article they got, not article, but this report, right, yesterday that the MLB is working with the uh, Players Association to to get, excuse me, to maybe bring back baseball in May. Um some of the some of the things you know they would be all in Arizona uh, in the middle of the summer. Let's let's play all of our games in the outdoor heat of Arizona. That's that's awesome. But you know some of the other things that they talked about doing was implementing an electronic strike zone to allow plate umpires to maintain you know six feet I guess behind everybody. Uh, there'd be no mound visits for the pitcher or for the catcher or pitching coach. Uh, there'd be a possibility of seven inning double headers. Uh, so that's pretty crazy to me. And then, you know, I guess on field microphones could be, could be used, you know, maybe to help TV viewing, but also I guess communication maybe between the teams also was what I'm thinking. Um, and then another crazy thing is this instead of sitting in the dugouts, right? They'd be sitting in the stands, which of course would be empty, and they'd have to sit six feet apart the entire time they were in the stands. I don't know, man. I mean, if you're gonna do it and you're gonna, you know, segregate these players from their separate these players from their families for four and a half months, isolate them, quarantine them, whatever you want to call it, for four and a half months, like let these guys just play baseball. Like, you're already quarantining them. Like they're gonna be running bases, they're gonna be doing all this kind of stuff, there's gonna be touching, there's gonna be this, like these little things going to help out so much, but what is your overall thought on the idea besides the fact that like you just be excited as hell to be baseball back in May? I I think it's dumb. Uh, I think it's premature to even think that in less than a month we can be playing this game at this point. Uh, Well, they didn't specify if if it was like beginning of the May or the end of the month, by the way, but True. That's, that being said, but assuming it's earlier than later, I mean, even even doing it later in May, okay, we might have a little bit of a better chance starting late May, but I, I just don't see them being able to make this work. Um, you know, players aren't going to play as well if they're missing their families, they can't see their families. <laughs> I mean, this this whole sitting in the stands thing is is ridiculous to me. Um, I mean, it's going to take forever for people to get into, you know, the field from from these stands. I feel well, like. they're clearly going to put in some sort of system. Well, I would well, think clearly yeah. they would put I, in like I mean, stairs so you can get to and from the stands pretty easily. But yeah, I agree with you, man. It seems stupid. Uh, it's, it's just. It's, it's I mean, silly. I get it. I. I I understand the reasoning behind trying to set it up this way um, to follow all the CDC guidelines, but just don't play. I I mean, do it right. You know, when you can get back, don't add in all this extra crap. I mean, we're probably already going to have to have some of these seven inning double headers regardless. 
I if they want to try to get in more games from a fantasy standpoint, that's going to suck. Um, from a player standpoint, it's going to suck. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. yeah, they, they may not have to play, uh, as long, you know, as they would, if it were a regular double header, you know, some guys may start the second game and then go to the bench, you know, uh, earlier in that game or whatever. But what happens if at the seventh inning they're tied? Hey, guess what? We're playing extra innings at that point, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I don't, I get the point behind it and, you know, they want to get the game going. Baseball has a, uh, a, a healing power, uh, so to speak sometimes. So I, I think sports it is in general. <laughs> it, well, yeah. I mean, sports in general does, but you know, I think it's just I think it's just too premature right now. Yeah, I mean, aside from the crazy rules, right? Um, I do. <laughs> however, the one thing I do find really funny about the rules, I, you know, they're, they're trying to slip in the electronic strike zone thing. I, I found that kind of funny. It was like, you know, the catcher and the batter is going to be like six inches from each other. <laughs> you mean to tell yeah. me the 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 umpire can't be the same distance? Uh yeah, they're just trying to get this electronic strike zone into the majors any way possible. And, you know, this is their way to kind of be like, oh, well, we have to for social distancing reasons. Then, oh, look, it worked. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I but just, I, I don't know. I don't, yeah. But I don't, my, my main thought, my first thought when all of this was being dropped yesterday was that you're right. It's premature. Um, you know, we've already seen it with the Japan Baseball League where they started and they've had to stop again. Um, and like, yeah, fine. Even if they do all these preventative measures, right? They're going to quarantine the teams. They're going to do all these things to separate them. That doesn't prevent. Are you also quarantining all the hotel staff where they are? Uh, all the stadium staff, you know, there's going to need to be people in the stadiums, keeping up, you know, keeping the, the stadiums and the grass and everything else up, you know, up to, uh, yeah, up to par. Um, everything, right? I mean, just everything. Everything these players come in contact with also need to be quarantined. It's just not going to happen. There will be some outside presence <clears throat> to possibly infect these players, and then as soon as like one player is infected, the whole thing shut down. You yeah. can't. You just can't do it. It's like the NBA. As soon as Gobert got infected, the whole thing shut down. It was like, well, we can't risk it. Now, I get it. NBA is a lot more physical of a sport than baseball, right? Especially contact wise. But you just you can't do it. So I, I just think it'd be silly for them to do it. I mean, unless I know things that, you know, you read all these reports about things are getting better. Things are improving here in the United States. But still nobody really knows. You know, we had like one good day like three days ago and there were kind of back at the same old numbers we were middle of last week again a slightly better but things would have to improve pretty drastically uh pretty quickly for this to even be an option in my opinion yeah and the last thing i'll say on it is eating i mean what are they going to do for food you know everybody now is already <clears throat> hoarding things at grocery stores as it is they're going to shut a grocery store down for two hours so a whole baseball team can come in and get what they need and clear the place out and where are they cooking it are they all going to be in suites in these hotels are yeah. they going to be in like double you know double occupancy rooms you know it Grub i didn't think about that but like i'm i'm sure well i'm sure it would have to be something where you know team controlled yeah you know, food but man it's just that's just kind of silly in my opinion it's just the whole idea this is kind of silly um Got everybody kind of excited for a minute, but I think reality set in and everybody's just like, nah, this ain't happening. No. All right. Um, so we, that was the only news I was going to talk about. And then about an hour ago, news of Brandon Cooks being traded to the Texans happened. Um, Bob is at it again. <laughs> traded a second round pick to the Rams. For Brandy Cooks and gave them back a 2022 fourth round pick. Eh, whatever. We'll get into this a little bit later because this actually has a pretty big effect on the best fits, I think. Uh, the Texans, in my opinion, were a receiver needy team. Now I do not see them as one. 
Not as much of a one, actually. Um, but I thought for sure they would be a, a target for a receiver. Um, but, like, what's your thought on this trade immediately? Like, like, why the hell did you trade away DeAndre Hopkins in the first place? I, I mean, I don't. Apparently, they uh, really like David Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I don't, I don't dislike the trade. I feel like they needed to get something. And but Brandon Cooks? It wasn't going to be through the draft. Okay, then whatever. But, I mean, Will Fuller was your number one. Dude has never spent <clears throat> more than five games on a, on, in a season, I feel like, on a field. Uh, um, he's talented as hell, but he's never healthy. Cooks is talented as well, but he did nothing last year. He was like an afterthought for the majority of the year. And I mean, at least in my opinion, I don't, maybe I'm missing something and he did play better than I think he did, but I didn't own him at all. So I just wasn't interested in following him and I never saw his name pop up in big things, but I mean, he's okay. I don't think he's worth a second round pick. No, dude, I, and I wish I could find. I don't know where in Slack Keith put this thing, but it is pretty crazy. The uh, the the picks that Cooks has been traded for. I know it's at least two first rounders, and I want to say a second rounder. Obviously, now, but like he's just been traded around. <clears throat> for some reason, every team is like, uh, he's we can get rid of him. <laughs> but like not everybody's they figuring out that like <laughs> maybe he's just not that awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean it's kind of mind boggling in my opinion. And and with as deep as this class is, which we'll talk about, I mean I don't I don't think I would have given up a second rounder. I to yeah, get, I to get totally him. agree. I mean now I think they had an extra second rounder, right? Because they got a second rounder back for for Hopkins in the Hopkins deal but still just yeah. seems kind of crazy that they would even do this but yeah all right well that being said let's move right into our <clears throat> our guest and our main topic for the night and that is Celian Lonku what's up man what up? Welcome to the show. Yep. Glad, yeah, so, glad to be here. So Celian is our fantasy six pack resident NFL draft expert. He does all the mock drafts. He has his own big board. And if you haven't seen it yet, go to his Twitter at Celian underscore FB um, and fill out the form that he has tagged on the top and you will get his draft guide, his player profile uh, uh, PDF that he, that he made. That thing is amazing. You sent it to me yesterday. Uh, it was just like, oh, my God. This is, there's so much information. Um, it's pretty incredible. You're giving it out for free. It's just it's crazy good. Um, so definitely go check that out. <clears throat> so before yeah. we jump into our main topic here let's do our beer of the week mm, beer all right Cillian, you are the guest uh not all of our guests want to participate in this but uh you did and we uh appreciate for that so you go well, first man i guess i get the honors to to introduce my own beer first i, I Absolutely. i'll take that as a a grateful honor um <laughs> i wanted to introduce a french beer i guess i failed in doing that i'm introducing a belgian beer which is a thing they're very great for for introducing to us um i am drinking a triple carmelite if you want to introduce that and pronounce that in the round in the right way it is a it is a i think you would call it an abbey ale uh it's very dark i like it because it's a bit smoky it's a bit round i don't know if that makes any sense but it's got a lot of taste and I, i'm a big fan of it um it's it's a bit strong it's eight eight percent but nice. I, I, it's like one of my favorite beers out there so belgian beer triple caramelite triple caramelite if you want to pronounce it in the english way i'll 
send you the the proper writing if you want to put that in the in the in the description if people can find it in america i think it's a it's a great beer sounds good man um all right aj what you got all right i'm uh taking a page out of your book here and going with the true respite uh, this one is the Week Away Hazy India Pale Ale. Solid uh, choice. <clears throat> it's a pint can. It's a. It's only a six and a half percenter, but you know that's okay. I feel like the 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 name of it being Week Away was uh was fitting since it's been weeks away from the office. Uh, even though I'm working at home, uh, you know it's just where where everybody's at right now. So it's pretty good though. It's uh it's definitely on the lighter side. Uh, smooth, you know, little little citrusy. Um, so I'm digging it so far. Yeah, actually, I, I lied to you. I thought I'd had that. I've stared at it a few times, but apparently I've gone with everything else that they've had, but oh. just not that one. But uh, I don't. I just feel like I've had a bunch of theirs. Why wouldn't I have had that one? But apparently I haven't. But um, yeah, anyway, good choice. I, I've been a big fan of their beers since I found them uh, in the yeah. last month or so, I feel like. Uh, another one that I have been picking up more uh more frequently is elder pine this one is called asleep on the forest floor uh it's a double ipa it's got simcoe citra and comet hops uh it's definitely um it's definitely like a it's got a lot of rye in it you can tell a lot of um yeah it's got some caramel flavor it it's it's pretty heavy actually. Um, it's definitely, it's a strong beer for sure. I mean, double IPA, I think it's 8.7. So yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely strong. I mean, not just because of the 8.7, but like it tastes strong, uh, yeah. but, but it's, but it's good, man. I like it. I gave it a four on untapped. So, uh, it's something I'll, I'll pick up again if I can find it. So awesome. All right, Cillian. Um, let's jump right into this, man. So we're going to just run through the positions, start with some quarterbacks and, uh, you know, I, so, you know, you're, you're the expert with the players, right? I, I, and obviously, you know, you know, the teams too, but, um, what, what I identified as teams that are QB needy, right? Right off the bat, obviously we know the Bengals, the chargers, I'd say the Pats are kind of QB needy. Uh, the Lions are a kind of a dark horse needy team. The Steelers could be one. The Colts, even though they they signed uh, Philip Rivers, you know he's old. Um, yep. The Dolphins, yeah. And I would just throw them out there. The Redskins too, right? I mean, I I wouldn't be shocked if they take a late yeah. flyer on on somebody. I don't think I, they're going out and grabbing. It, I, I'm I'm very interested <clears throat> in having your take on the whole Redskins quarterback situation. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about that later. Do you not remember my reaction to them drafting Haskins last year? <laughs> oh, it was I, pretty I bad. It was do. pretty bad. So, uh, I don't think they're gonna grab Tua, and I don't think they should at this point. Um, but. Uh, I think they could go out and grab one of these later round quarterbacks and just say, why not? But of course we have like three draft picks, so I don't know when they could do it is kind of the problem. Uh, but <clears throat> let's jump right into this and go with Joe Burrow, LSU quarterback, Heisman winner, national trophy winner. Um, give us a little intro of this guy you know break him down just a little bit and then uh yeah give us where you think his the best fit for him would be all right well well to start off in terms of introducing joe burrow i think my favorite trait when we're talking about joe burrow is his toughness um i was i think you guys know i was very late in the process in terms of rising joe burrow up and up my draft board um and the game that really sold him to me was that auburn game he was so tough and gritty the way he got up after contact the way he he was making throws under pressure i remember plays with derrick brown just bounce just rushing into his knees mid mid route and he was just delivering a dime to justin jefferson in third on third down it was it was unbelievable unbelievable in terms of of just leading your team in the clutch and and in a very difficult situation and honestly a type of dis- situations we haven't seen in in the playoffs and in other games i think that was the game that really sold burrow to me in terms of his toughness and his grit and i think that's a very underrated 
underrated trait that you look for in a quarterback. So that was my favorite thing about Burrow. I think he's very good manipulating the pocket. He has good accuracy. I think the numbers show that throughout his season. Um, he spreads the ball around the way he was able to hit a, a probable future top draft pick in Jamar Jefferson and, and Justin Jefferson just spread out the targets. He he spread it out to Thaddeus Moss. He was going out to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. He's very quick getting through progressions. He's very aware of what he's going through. If there are a couple things he could work on, I think, and and we're really nitpicking here, and and there's things that he could work on at the next level that might stand out as weaknesses <clears throat> once he moves on to the NFL. It's diagnosing blitzes. We saw him have issues with that early in the national championship game against Clemson, and and, and just maybe getting a bit a bit more decisive in in his in his decision making. I like his timing, I like his anticipation, but it's a bit too too inconsistent. Sometimes he gets a bit late and and gets caught with caught with interceptions, especially at, at, in the Alabama Alabama game. There was a pick to to Trevon Trevon Diggs. I didn't like the decision making on that one, um, and several other 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 thoughts I I, re- I wrote down that that I wasn't a big fan of. But really, when when I think of Joe Burrow and and I've seen that comp thrown around a lot, and I've seen a lot of other th- other comps uh, thrown around, and people take compar- compares comparisons um, the wrong way. They're like, this is what someone's going to be at the next level. They're taking the the ceiling of the player and assuming this is what we're projecting them to. And and that's just wrong. And what I think of Joe Burrow and the best way to project Joe Burrow to someone that hasn't watched Joe Burrow is Tony Romo. It's his way of getting out of the pocket, making plays out of structures, mm. keeping poise, keeping his eyes downfield, making plays just, just, is that playmaking outside of the structure and and keeping poison, keeping his eyes and and keeping that accuracy and just delivering dimes and and you saw that from Tony Romo at the NFL and at the college level, and that's what I really loved about Joe Burrow. And if I was asked to describe him to someone that hasn't watched Joe Burrow, I think it's the accurate way to describe him. And I that I don't think there's any other players in terms of familiarity um, that that fit that bill better. Now he doesn't have. Um, Joe Burrow's arm strength. Uh, he doesn't have Tony Romo's arm strength. Uh, he doesn't have traits that Tony Romo that made Tony Romo that great. But he, some of the tr- traits that he has to work on. But I think it, it fits that bill in terms of easy, <clears throat> easy description and and just off the top of what makes each pe- player that unique. Now, if I was to project him into a specific system and to a, a specific uh, team need and an ideal landing spot, I think. It's tough to imagine anything other than the Bengals. For one, um, in terms of just starting right away, I think Burrow's 23. Um, he doesn't have much development um, time to to offer. I think Zach Taylor's a quarterback guru. He's he's a former quarterback himself, drafted in 2000s. I think he he can really get the best out of Burrow. I think they run a good West Coast scheme that could really fit what Burrow does. I think he has some good weapons around him in terms of Joe Mixon getting out of the backfield. He's a good pass catcher. He offers good running between the – he's a very well-rounded back to support Joe Burrow. <laughs> Um, they're going to have Jonah Williams to get out at left tackle and protect his blind side. They invested a little bit in in their O line, and I'm sure they will in the draft as well. Uh, that defensive line is better if they can get a little secondary. That defense should get better. I like their their linebacker court. Um, and they have they have Tyler Boyd outside. And and if we're thinking about AJ Green, if he can stay healthy, he should be a, a good piece, a good reliable 50-50 ball type piece that that Joe Burrow can turn to. John Ross, I think, is still a, a good deep threat that he can sling the ball to. I think this is the best landing spot we can think of for Joe Burrow. And and conveniently, it is the most realistic uh landing yeah. spot as well. So absolutely tell me what you guys think about that. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, for me, I just think as far as immediate playing time and, you know, yeah, I know everybody wants to kind of, you know, poop on the on the Bengals because they were terrible last year. But A.J. Green is going to come back and you have to hope he can stay, you know, moderately healthy. He hasn't been able to do that the last couple of years of his career. But, you know, if you can get 12 games out of him along with Joe Burrow, that's just going to help Joe Burrow so much more. I mean, I, yeah, I love Tyler Boyd as much as the next guy. 
but AJ Green's better. I mean, Perry, he just is. He's a better receiver when when healthy. Um, I think they're so. very complementary. <clears throat> I think I think they work best together. I think Tyler Boyd's a pretty good route runner, and I think Tyler, I think AJ Green offers that big play potential. I, I think they uh, work I mean, fine together. <clears throat> yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that they don't fit together, but I I, I think overall, like AJ Green, you know, in his prime, was more talented than Boyd. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. like, <clears throat> yeah, Boyd's old or. Green's older, so he's not he's not there anymore. But you know, I, I think uh, Green, when he's on the field, can outperform Boyd more often than not. But either way, like, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's the best fit. Um, I, I I love the Romo cop. I haven't heard that before. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, he can just you know be more uh, clutch. I clutch think is the word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. But AJ, what do you think? Yeah, anything to add here? Or should we just move on? Yeah, I think as long as uh, as long as Burrow doesn't have to field, um, you know, place kicks and and kick off or, uh, <laughs> field goals, I, I think him him Zing. as Romo yeah. is, is great. Uh, as the uh, uh, it, Eagles it, it and is Redskins a really good fan. comparison. And Romo was a solid quarterback, <clears throat> um, you know, the majority of the time, just not really in the playoffs. It's just in terms of pocket manipulation and just the yeah. way they escape that. It, it's perfect in my opinion. I loved it. All right, so the next guy we got here is uh, probably the almost the most talked about, I feel like, at least recently, um, is Mr. Tua, um, uh, Taga Viola, maybe? I guess that's Tua right. Tua Tagovailoa, and I have practiced it, my man. I have <laughs> not, as you can see. <clears throat> I'm going to um, need to for our show in a couple of weeks, man. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I knew how to say it, but... Um, yeah, I mean, Alabama quarterback, um, the guy was phenomenal until he got hurt. So that's obviously the biggest uh, the biggest kicker here. And, you know, everybody's looking at what, what he can do now or if he's more of a stash guy. So what are your thoughts on Tua? Well, I think the first thing you have to bring up is the injury. And sadly, it is the first thing you have to bring up. And I and I agree with that concern. But I think he's really bounced back for some of the injuries he's had. I mean, when you think about the ankle injuries early in 2018, he still was able to produce in 2019 until he got hurt again. It's just those lingering, that lingering uh, aspect of his injuries that, that is worrying. And then, and then he got the, the bad hip injury, which is just... I guess unlucky, if you would say. But I don't. I don't think the hip is the biggest issue. I think the issue with most teams is the hip, uh, the hip. I'm sorry, the ankle, both ankles. Um, and I did read a report recently on that I saw on Twitter. I'm not fully confident in the in the authenticity of it, but it would make sense that mo- that two teams in the draft have t- taken uh, Tagovailoa off their board based off mm. those ankle injuries and not the hip injuries, just the ankle injuries. And they linger. They've lingered in college, and there is there is a significant risk that they would linger back into the pros. I mean, ankle injuries are tough to get over. Um, it's something to keep in mind. Now, outside of that, and I do not account um, injuries into my draft evaluations, I do give a little red flag for them, but I do not account them in my in my draft grades. I think Tua Tagovailoa is a great quarterback. I think he's very cerebral in the way he he processes the field. He can get through progressions. He's very accurate. He's got a, a great great plethora of throws. He can go deep. He can go on a rope. He can he can sling with velocity. He can really throw with touch above above different layers and coverage. Um, the cerebral aspect is is the way that he can he can manipulate coverages with his eyes. I've seen him move linebackers with his eyes, move safeties. Uh, aim to the right, turn his feet back to the left, and just and just deliver a dime to to players like Jerry Judy or 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 even Henry Ruggs on the slant that could take it to the house. It's just he had such a plethora of, and that's one thing that I do I do want to point. I, that might be a question mark is is the amount of talent he had around him. He didn't have to make too many big time throws. He he could get away with a quick screen or a quick slant to a player and. and his receivers had the talent to take it to the house, um, and that does affect his stats. And if someone is just looking at the box score, don't get carried away because a lot of his, a lot of that can can come from can come from that outside wide receiver production. 
but the talent is undeniable. It's his way of of diagnosing coverages pre play pre snap. Now he does get attached to his pre snap diagnosis. I I thought sometimes he could get away. And the one play that comes to my mind is in the national championship against Clemson um, last season. It, he was reading cover one uh, with with um, what's his name uh, Trayvon Mullen on on Jerry Judy. Uh, it looked like cover one. Trayvon Mullen gets into bail technique, drops back into cover three. He misdiagnoses that. He's, either he doesn't see it or he's stuck on that pre-snap read, slings it deep to Jerry Judy, which which was running, who was running from the slant. Uh, initially, it was meant to be one-on-one and at worst had outside leverage on the safety and, and should, have, should have had that throw. But since Trayvon Mullen was dropping out of bail, ba- uh, out of, uh, bail technique and, and getting into that, that deep third, he had a read on the ball, gets in, makes the pick, and it's just that those issues diagnosing uh, mid snap, mid mid play, mid play um, rotations and co- coverage rotations, and just wrong, wrong, uh, just defensive coordinators just playing with his mind. That's just one of the things he's gonna have to work on, and that's one of the things that I think could really impact his year one, his year one uh, production in terms of fantasy, in terms of of making making the right reads and and staying aware inside in, within one play and within one rep just knowing what he's dealing with and and readapting his plan and moving on to the next pro- progression i think it's really something he's going to have to work on in, in that aspect so i would limit inter i would limit the expectations for year 1 for Tua but he's got things that are very workable we've seen quarterbacks work on their on their diagnosis over over time and I think Tua can do that. Now, the best landing spot for him to do that, I think, is the Dolphins because they have Ryan Fitzpatrick stepping in from year one. He can do it. He can he can help that team. He can he can be the starter while Tua develops, works on those mental aspects. Now, whether they'll let Fitzpatrick do that or they'll throw uh, Tua into the into the fire. That's up to them, but I think the best situation for them, the Dolphins, and for Tua is to let Fitzpatrick go out there go in the wild and and take take over the team while Tua develops makes his mistakes in practice pull the leash little by little and then you can throw Tua out maybe second half of the year maybe year two but I think he does need some time to one get over his injuries and two get over those mental aspects of mid rep mid rep mistakes that he makes that are easy to get over but need some time so I, I I define the Dolphins as a, uh, as the best suit for him. What what do you guys think? I don't think I, anybody's good for the Dolphins. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I would I would have thought the good. Chargers. I, I, for him. I like the Chargers uh, more more so than the Dolphins. But okay, that's uh, fair. Just I, I think I they got more talent. Uh, the Dolphins are kind of just. I don't want anybody that I remotely care about in fantasy going to Adam Gase. Yeah, Gase is... that is a fair point. That is a fair point, but I do <laughs> think in terms of I, I, it, Gase is now with the Jets. Okay, for one. Oh right, but for two, <laughs> ah, mix that up. Thank two. you. As soon as I said <laughs> it, I was like, uh, "Did I say that wrong?" That's I okay. Go, I, I, I agreed with it. So, but either way, I, I, I just the you. Dolphins are still just not good, man. Like they, I don't know. I, I think just feel they like got it's just... good weapons now. I think they got they yeah. got Preston Williams, which I. I, I like Will. I wish last year. I, I last year I integrated a lot of off-field issues into my grades, and I kind of knocked Preston Williams off my board. And I wish I didn't because this guy, outside of the off-field issues, has great tape, and now he's really showing. He was really showing out this year until the injury. Right. I, I think they got good receivers. If if Devontae Parker plays to the level that he has, and you get <laughs> Preston Williams, you got you got uh, what's his name, Jordan Howard now. Offering as a as a third down or a goal line back, I think this offense is starting to look decent. You got Eric Flowers, a guard is not a bad guard, okay, and and I think this offense is not, and Gesicki at tight ends a good dump off option. I think this offense is not that disgusting, and the acqu- acquisitions they made on defense, this team is not bad. They got a ton of picks too, so who knows? I don't know. I just prefer the the Chargers as a, as a landing spot for them. You know, I think he would be able to play right away too for fantasy, which you're saying isn't a good thing for him. But I think he would beat out Tyrod a lot easier than as much as I hate it because you know go Hokies. I agree. But with that. Uh, I think he could beat out Tyrod a lot easier than he could beat out Fitzpatrick. <laughs> so uh, yeah, 
Maybe. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think I don't think the Chargers are sold on Tyrod. <laughs> Nobody has been, <laughs> so whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I like I like Tyrod as a quarterback, quarterback, NFL quarterback, but for fantasy, I don't know. But I think he's he's secure with the ball, and I think a lot of franchises um, value that a lot. But outside of that, he doesn't offer much game breaking. No, he's game a backup. Traits. He's a backup at this point. I don't know. AJ, you got anything to add, or should we just move on to Justin Herbert? No, let's see. Uh, let's talk about some Herbert. All right, so yep, there we go, man. Justin Herbert, Oregon quarterback, uh, came into the year as one of the the big time quarterbacks and kind of slipped through, right, slipped down the board a little bit. Um, that happens when you decide to stay in school. F- seems like far far more often, man. Um, what do you think about this guy and where's he going? He's a, he's a tough evaluation, man. <clears throat> just just based off the scheme and the system he operates in. All Oregon quarterbacks are, man. Right, it's just a ton of screens, just just slants, just easy outs, RPOs. He, he's tough to evaluate, but you just gotta love the arm talent from him. And and, and when he's in rhythm, the decision making, the way he gets through his progressions, that is good. It's is it's just he plays too cautious, in my opinion. It's tough to to have a firm firm confidence in him because he's too I think he's too cerebral too too aware of of the risk and in the way he played college football at least and if a coach can really take out take that out of him I think he has the potential to be great but right now I'm just so afraid of investing in in terms of fantasy investing in Justin Herbert that I think that's going to translate to maybe a lot of teams as well uh, my my perfect landing spot for him was the Chargers, which who you had for the for Tua, yeah. um, partly because I kind of believed in in Sirad to to take some time away from from Herbert, but maybe they can they they can start him right away. I think I think what the two what the I think the weapons the Chargers have in place can allow to bring the best out of Herbert in terms of the play action game with with Eckler in the background in terms of the the 50-50 ball threats in terms of, of uh, Mike Williams out there and, and the separation experts in terms uh, you have you have uh, what's uh, Keenan Allen out there you, you really have decent weapons out there if you can protect him and keep yeah. keep pressure away and keep him away from from those rush decisions and and from losing that inconsistent um, inconsistent mechanics mechanics under pressure and inconsistent uh, accuracy that he he can kind of find under pressure. I think he can succeed. You just want to get that vertical game out. You want him to get the ball out quickly in rhythm to those weapons, and I think that could really make him work. Yeah, I mean, that's all the reasons why I like almost anybody going to the Chargers. Really, like Chargers are almost like the ideal landing spot for any of these quarterbacks out here. But um, that that is a quarterback needy team. Let me put it that way, and they could oh, play yeah. right away. But um, yeah, I, I I can agree with you on on the Chargers as well. AJ, yeah, I think I think that's a solid spot. Um, definitely. I mean, I, also the Lions to me kind of jumps out as a possible decent fit. I mean, Stafford's not ready to go out yet, but I mean, he's not a spring chicken either, and he's had some injury issues. I mean, you saw the the garbage that they threw out there behind him last year; it just <laughs> yeah. wasn't working at all. Um, so I could see him as a potential fit there as well. But all I think, right. yeah, I think the lines are interesting if you, if you sit Herbert for a little bit, but I think, yeah, I think Stafford Herbert's- offers that much more confidence in his, in his arm yeah. and Stafford has nothing to envy on, on Herbert's arm. I think they're both in that same caliber in terms of arm talent. I, I think Stafford has, I don't know. I don't. I think unless you want to sit Herbert, uh, Herbert for a year or two and see what you got and and see whether he's better on better than Stafford or not. I don't. I don't see a huge need to go after a quarterback like like Herbert unless you really want to change your offense. I guess. But yeah, yeah my that's... thought would definitely be to have him sit. But there's there's enough teams out there that I feel like are more geared towards going and getting somebody now. So yep. Um, all right, the last guy we got listed here is Mr. Jordan Love. Um, hmm. I, I mean, Utah State, interesting interesting option here. 
Uh, definitely not the fastest <laughs> guy out there. Uh, senior though, you don't you don't usually see too many seniors hanging out there. So, uh, what are your thoughts on on Love? There's quite a bit of Mountain West quarterbacks that when they come out and get drafted in the first round, they perform okay. But I now I do not have a first round grade on on, on Jordan Love. As a matter of fact, I'm very cautious when I speak on on Jordan Love. The fantasy value I find in Jordan Love is developmental. I think if you, I do not think, first of all, I do not think you should draft Jordan Love. I think it's someone that you should, you will probably find free agency after year one and you should stash. I think the best value you can get out of him is if he gets drafted to a team like Green Bay or the Indianapolis Colts. I think the Colts is the best landing spot for him because, for, for one, he's going to sit behind a great coach in Frank Reich, a coach that can really tame. Tame that arm talent out of you. I think what the what the Chiefs did with Pat Mahomes when Pat Mahomes was coming out, he's ve- he was very out of control. He was very backyardish with with his football. He was slinging the ball around. There was there was a lot of mistakes. When I don't know if you guys remember when he arrived in the NFL during training camp, we were getting reports that was like, yeah, Pat Mahomes threw five picks today in practice. Yeah, Pat Mahomes threw four picks today in practice. And, and everyone was like, oh, this guy's just throwing picks everywhere. And everyone was freaking out. And then guess what? Pat Mahomes did not start for a whole year. They were letting Pat Mahomes get the mistakes out of him, slowly but surely pulling that leash back, taming the arm talent, taming, taming his decision making, letting him know what he was looking at. And I think that is the blueprint you need to work with with Jordan Love. That's why I think the perfect fit is the Indianapolis Colts. They will have Philip Rivers on a one-year contract. And I know Rivers wants to stay there for more. He moved his whole family to Indianapolis. He wants he he thinks this is a good future for him. He thinks, but I for the Colts interest and for fantasy interest, I do not think that in terms of being a Colts, like for Colts fans. I don't think having Philip Rivers long term is the good answer unless you're going to win right now. I think if you can let uh, Jordan Love develop behind him, tame that arm talent, let him make the right decisions. I think he's got great potential. It's just the decision making and the whole getting through progressions right now. He's way too raw to get into the NFL and start from year one. And if they can develop him in terms of fantasy output, you'll get great returns in year two, year three. What do you guys think? What about another team? And like, I don't really know where Jordan Love fits. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, he's kind of one of these guys that I just, I honestly don't know a ton about. Um, But from everything you said, what about the Steelers? They're kind of in that same situation where Ben's talked about retiring a couple of times already. And I think he's only coming back because he got hurt like like game one last year. So he's just like, I want to play at least three more games. Um Like, what about him? I, mean, I the, do not hate it. Yeah, I mean, I think I it's the same type of scenario where he could sit behind Ben, hopefully at least for half a season before he gets hurt. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's great weapons there too. Um, and obviously we know the coaching staff and Definitely. ownership there is is ideal for almost anybody. So I think that'd be a pretty decent fit too. Definitely. That, sound, that sounds like a great landing spot as well, especially with the running game they got going. They can play off play action as well. I think Absolutely. that's something that Jordan Love does really well. So it, it's it's an interesting landing spot as well. AJ, you got anything? No, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Man of many, man of uh, very few words. We're good, though. All right. Off to the running backs. Start off here with... Uh, our, ugh, I lost my spot here. Sorry about that. Um, so my running back needy teams that I have identified, and I'm sure there's many, many more, but uh, Tampa Bay, the Dolphins, I, kn- I know they signed Jordan Howard, but is Jordan Howard really anybody's answer? Mm. <clears throat> Phillies, uh, Eagles, um, Rams. <laughs> I-, I think the Steelers are kind of a dark horse running back needy team. I mean, Connor went down and, it was not great after that. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of other running back needed teams. If you look at like backup potential, I mean, the Colts have kind of been thrown out there, but I, I just feel like they have a lot. The Chiefs have been thrown out there as a team that needs a, needs a running back, but 
uh, they they have so many. I feel like they they, they just signed DeAndre Washington uh, yesterday. I feel like too. So they've got like eight running backs from their team. I guess maybe they don't believe in any of them. So maybe that's why they're a running back needy team. Um, I, I don't know. Like maybe the maybe the Falcons as a backup to Gurley because maybe you don't trust Gurley. Uh, th- there's a ton of teams out there that you could pose as like a as a backup team, as a, as a backup running back. But I think the Bucks, the Dolphins, and the Rams are like the three leaders in my mind. Maybe, maybe I'm totally forgetting somebody. It's like somebody who could just come in and take the job outright easily. Um, but start off here with DeAndre Swift. Um, you know, all, all of these running backs, these aren't in really in any general – the quarterbacks were kind of in order, but the running backs are kind of – depending on your list and – Cillian, your list is kind of this, but um, other lists are the complete opposite, (laughs) right? I mean, the running backs and the receivers are just put them in a cup, throw the dice out, and be like, oh, that's the order now? Okay, cool. Let's try again. And it's fine. At least like the top two or three for each one is kind of interchangeable. Uh, But DeAndre Swift, Georgia running back, uh, give us your thoughts on him. All right. Well, I agree with you in the first place in terms of the team that you highlighted in biggest need for running back. And even for the Steelers, I think we're on the same page in that aspect. Um, but if we're talking about the the running back, need, the the running back DeAndre Swift, I think the, the first thing people need to remember is this freshman season. This guy was taking snaps away from Chubb and, uh, and Sony Michelle. This guy was in the rotation when these two starting NFL running backs were with Georgia, this guy was in the in the in the books from from year one. He he wasn't even a redshirt. He was already playing. So this is number one. This is something that people tend to forget. This was a just like Jonathan Taylor was a year one impact guy. Jordan uh, DeAndre Swift was doing the exact same thing. Now what I love most when I watch him is his patience, his his vision. He was be, he was playing behind a pro set. He was playing behind a lot of power running, a lot of of of, of zone running, a lot of different schemes in front of him. And his patience, decisiveness, the way he would set up people out of the mesh point, set up second level defenders. He was very decisive decisive in what he was doing so just like most the top the consensus top four running backs in this class i think they're very versatile in terms of the the schemes they would fit in now the 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 best team i i defined i actually defined two best teams for for deandre swift i thought as many people would love i thought the kansas city chiefs would be great um now i'm a big fan of damian williams i think Damien Williams could go on and keep on carrying the rock for the for the for the Chiefs, but seeing Swift in that system would be so much fun in terms of that that <laughs> quick cut yeah. ability and the, the the shiftiness, the quickness. I mean, you you guys have probably seen it. it. It's just it would be having that talented of a back end there would be fun. And then at San Francisco because they run a zone scheme, and I think his vision could really be his vision and 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 decisiveness could really be put into value in there. So. I thought that would be a fun mention in there. So what do you guys think? I think he's very versatile. So, Yeah, I, I like Swift. I think, uh, I mean, he's he's fast enough. I mean, he's not, you know, slow, but he's not the fastest guy out there either. But he gets it done, and, and I just think that everything that he brings, you know, as a complete back, um, he's going to – he's definitely going to help out whoever decides to take – the plunge on them uh and you know any team that does is going to be happy with what they get out of them um you know just just the explosiveness that he has on the field alone um is great for the game and and i think that that's going to help in the nfl i think he'll be able to carry that over very easily um you know some backs you see they don't really end up being able to transition with that and they they kind of get bottled up, but I think it, his patience and, and vision is really going to help him at the next level and and be successful at the next level as well. Um, as far as a landing spot, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Dolphins get him, but mm. you know, I don't know. I, I I'm not I'm not really sure if they if they don't go in after Tua, um, you know, I could see them going after Swift. 
On the Dolphin, the Dolphins is interesting because I, I did want to make a point about the whole running back and a rebuild thing. Um, is is running back really the first place you want to go in terms of rebuilding your team? I think that's like the last piece in your rebuild. And I would not be surprised if the Dolphins go after him because mm, I don't think they're that far along. Uh, they're that far back as, as people would like to think. But uh, if we're thinking of a rebuilding team, I don't know. I, I would not be surprised, but I don't know if that's the – because NFL teams have done it before, but I don't know if that's the way they should go. But it would definitely be a great landing spot for him in terms of fantasy because he would see instant production. <laughs> and yeah, they, yeah. Could, they could just they could just roll in roll in uh, Howard at the goal line or, or third and one situations. Like, yeah, I mean, I I agree. I, I, I think the Dolphins are, are a phenomenal fit for Swift, but I, I don't see it happening. But as far as best fit, that's probably one of the top spots oh, yeah. from immediate value. Um, my, my question for you, and I don't want to give any more analysis. We've already done all that. Question for you is, why did you pick ideal landing spots that have a plethora of running backs that are very capable for a guy like Swift, more, who is like the number one? I think he's way more talented than any other running back they have in their roster. I think I love Raheem Mostert. He's a, he's he's got a great burst. He can go, but outside of that, what is he? He's in a zone scheme. It's easy to to place running backs that that have that that one those one or two traits, and maybe that's what that's what um, that, uh, Shanahan loves. That's what he loves in that zone scheme is that he can he can get a, vari- a variety of backs that that can get that vision go off of one step. But I would love to see someone Man. that can go and sequence <sighs> cuts and just make multiple people miss and then finish physically falling forward for those two, three extra gritty yards. I want to see someone more complete in that offense. I just, I think I, if you could tell me he was going to get 50% of the, of the snaps in San Francisco as a running back, I'd be all for it. But I have exactly. a bad feeling if he were to go to San Fran, he'd be fighting with Mustard. Obviously, Brita. He's way more talented. He's way I more get talented. it. I get it. I get it. I I agree with you, but I absolutely dread him going to a team like San Fran, where it's a Shanahan system. He's going to spread the ball around to so many people. He's going to see limited opportunities, and Swift just doesn't pan out. Especially year one, you know, like that's where I'm like, maybe that's Absolutely. not the best landing spot. So that's where I'm like, eh. Kansas City now, okay. But Damian uh, Williams is a bigger. I like threat, Damian Williams me than than Moster and and Breda But is he? And, and is he? Is he though? Oh yeah. Let's think about this for a second. Let's think about this for one, just, just one second with Kansas City because we had this talk last year. AJ, you and I talked about this, yeah. and I forget who was on the show that 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 week that we did it. But think about all the all the moves that they have made at the running back position with Damian Williams as the starter, right? Um. Last year, they drafted a guy, two guys, um, one who was just like his stock rose immensely and just then bottomed out. Um, then they signed little Sean McCoy like at the 11th hour before the NFL season started. How much trust do they really have in Damian Williams? Now, I'm on board with you to where I think Damian Williams is way more talented than maybe the Chiefs think that he is. And they probably know way more than me, so maybe we should believe them. Uh, but I, I just – I don't know. the I think the Chiefs is a decent spot to where, like, I think they're trying to find a way to get away from Damian Williams. And any running back who gets a lot of work in the Kansas City offense is immensely valuable. So, yeah, I love this spot for him if he can get there. Um, I'm just not sure they would actually go there, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh- I think the Chiefs are afraid in investing once the time comes in Damian Williams. I'm not sure he's worth the money they would have to invest in once once his free agency round comes around. So I right. think that's the real issue. And and if they were to invest in someone, it, it'd be for the future and for the past uh, Damian Williams era. Sure. I, I think that that's how far that's how far ahead it will go. And <laughs> yep. No, no, that's 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 fine. I just those were very interesting landing spots to see from the number one, your potential number one running back off the board. So I just want to get into first, that. I think you could do a ton of a ton of different places and still produce, but I think those are. <laughs> I just sure. really want to see him in his own scheme and see how how he'd run hard, man. He'd be fun. <laughs> 
I wonder what Swift would do with Brady. Oh, that's interesting. Think about that it. At the box with Brady, Brady loves to check down and things like that. Like, I think that would be I, phenomenal. I, you know, I got really you know, another player for Brady, though. Yeah. <laughs> got another player for Brady. But uh, anyway, yeah. let's move on, AJ. Let's, let's, let's get going. All right. This. All right. So, so the next guy we got here is Jonathan Taylor. Uh, I mean, this guy's done nothing but destroy opponents. Um, he ran a four thirty nine at in the forty Whoa. at the combine. Did not expect that. Not gonna lie, that's, that's <laughs> absurd. Really um, didn't expect that. Back to back Doak Walker Award winner. I, I mean, I don't know what this guy can't do. Um, I, he's my favorite running back in in this draft, honestly. But what are your thoughts on on Taylor from Wisconsin? Man, he's so fun. He's one of those guys, historic production in college. And if you've had a chance to watch him, you get it. It's, it's, he's one of the most fun quarter, uh, running backs to study uh, in terms of getting like 200 yards a game. He got that regularly in his season. I think last season he got on like six out of 12 games. That's like unreal production, especially in the Big 12 with that level defenses. Um, I think he's got the vision, the patience, he's got the power. Now, what I would criticize from him is the efficiency once he gets to the second and third level in terms of spatial awareness and exploiting the space he sees and getting playing to these blocker's hips. It's just it's the same type of things you would see from Miles Miles Sanders last year when you were evaluating him. It's he would get way too wide into his breaks, way too wide into his gaps, and just while he was getting great yardage, and even in the NFL, he could have gotten even more if he stayed tight, made sharp cuts, stayed behind his blockers. I think he's still got a lot to work on in that aspect. Now, his power, his contact balance, he can move a pile. And that's why I still got a first-round grade on, on Jonathan Taylor. I think he's got so many great traits, and traits, and everything he work on is is very coachable. So he's still a great running back. Now, my perfect fit for Jonathan Taylor was the Los Angeles Rams or New Orleans. Now, the Rams right now, all the only, like, I'm a fan of Justin Jackson, but in terms of who they really want to start at this point, as far as I'm aware, is Austin Eckler. I was very disappointed in the snaps that, that Jackson got once when you Melvin Gordon was out. He said Rams. Just Want to make oh, sure Chargers, we're on the same my page. bad. Okay, it's, just want to make sure we're on Los the same Angeles page. Yeah, I know. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Like, like screw <laughs> that. If we're being honest, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to make sure we're on the same page because the uh, the you know Keith did these slides and he no, put the Chargers. I said, and yeah, the Chargers. The Rams, I meant the like, Chargers for, minute, what for, for him. Cool. All good. All good. The whole, <clears throat> they should have stayed in San Diego. Anyways, <laughs> I agree. I wish they had. <laughs> Anyways, you, you you got Austin Eckler, and I th- I think he offers a good change of pace option. I think he could really see a majority of the snaps, and and we saw that when when Gordon got back, they 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 put Gordon as the feature back, and they they're not sell they're not fully sold on Eckler being a feature back option. Now I'm a fan of Justin Jackson, but he still didn't get, saw the snaps when when Gordon was gone. So I think it's a good option to go to. I think he fits their scheme. I think he. He can really he can run. He's a one cut back. I think he's he's a guy that could really power through something that Eckler doesn't have a great trait. Doesn't can't really pick up on his own. So something he can do. And same thing with the Saints. I think if if they move on from Latavius Murray, he can take on that role for them, and and he can be very productive in doing so. And we saw we saw Kamara's pr- production go down a little bit over the last two years since his rookie season, and. They might turn to to a more complementary role and a more fifty fifty role for for Kamara and whoever is going to take on that that power back run. And I think with his power, his contact balance, I think Jonathan Taylor can really take that role on for and and be productive for fantasy wise for for the Saints. What do you guys think, Joe? Any thoughts on Taylor? Um. These are not two spots that I immediately went to. Um, I, I actually kind of believe that Eckler can be a lead back. I mean, we saw it last year for, you know, however many games it was where he was. He was a monster. Um, yeah, but that maybe. was with Rivers. True. But, hey, we're talking they're going to get Tua, so whatever. Uh, 
that's fair. I, that's fair. I, I, I think, well, whatever they get, if they get Tua, they ain't getting Taylor. Right. So, well, whatever. Yeah. Um, hey, Tua Taylor <laughs> is a monster back. If we're talking like in terms of draft strategy, yeah, they would never, insane. they would never get both. Right. I mean, are they, do they have hey, two they first could. round picks? They really I could. I haven't studied the draft. Do they have two first round picks? They have, no, they have a first round and a second round and, and Taylor like running backs and slide to the second round. Like, yeah, I feel like, I feel like Taylor's going to be one of those guys who that somebody late is going to trade into the first round and like snag him, right? That's you know, possible. Just, that that fits, uh, we that see fits that happen years. a lot for some reason, but it may, and maybe it's the Chargers. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, as far as good spots, like dude, the Rams. I mean, <laughs> I mean. Although I don't know, do they want another running back who's got like a ton, as you mentioned, as a weakness here, a ton of high mileage on him already? Um, I got, I got, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's kind of you know like Taylor could be a good fit for them too, you know, the, the, you know. But yeah, really, any running back needy team is a good fit for him. So, oh, hundred percent. Any any team he could get touches in terms of fantasy wise is. I, th- I think he's a guy you just got to get the ball in his hand. He's just going to break one tackle, break two tackles, get those extra yards. Dude, it's crazy. He, he goes into those piles, man. Like, you see the highlights time and time again. He goes into the middle, and then he just pops just, out the other hey, side. You're like, where did you go? <laughs> it's like. It, is that he's got insane contact balance. I think I think people fell in love with, with uh, David Montgomery last year. I think JT is, is a two times David Montgomery. I had a second round grade on Montgomery. I got a first round grade on JT because. He's just so much better and more confident getting into those those Dude, gaps. Player profiler, the best comparable for him, Zeke. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh. that is insane. <laughs> wow, what? it's amazing. I mean, the, hey, I'll take it. <laughs> anyway, well, to be honest, about that website, I saw that they had Jerry Rice for CD Lamb. I was like, what? No. Oh, look, it's best comparable. So as you say, it's a lot sometimes like ceiling, right? So yeah, yeah, again, yeah. it's not it's not absolute. But anyway, let's move on here. No, it's J- interesting. Yeah, J.K. Dobbins, Ohio State. Um, obviously, you know, just another another Ohio State running back, right? What do, what do we oh, got here? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, in terms of production, this guy checks the box. This guy is the second leader in in uh, in in team history behind. Behind, ahead of, of Ezekiel Elliott. Um, I think he's got great vision. I think he's got better vision and decisiveness than, than Taylor. Now, not to say that Taylor has bad <laughs> I, I I highlighted that for Taylor earlier. There's just say that these are two backs that are very comparable in the same class. Now, I think that between the tackles, Taylor uh, Dobbins is a lot more creative. He can he can make a player miss. He, he's got a nice spin move, actually, a very underrated spin move. He's good receiving out of the backfield. Um, it's just that wiggle and 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 the way he can keep he can he can maintain top speed uh, once he's getting to the third level. It's, it's the way he can make a safety miss. I'm I'm a lot more concerned and the efficiency. The same way I'm concerned with uh, with with uh, with Taylor's run efficiency, I'm concerned with Dobbins' run efficiency and the way he can get into gaps and get skinny. Uh, his vision, though, is he's just as decisive. He's just as patient. They're two. They're two. To give you an actual illustration of how close I have these guys rated, and I keep going back and forth. I have a six point seven nine on Dobbins, a six point seven, uh, six point seven nine on Taylor, and six point seven eight on Dobbins. So I keep yeah. flipping these guys back and forth. Like these guys can be three, in, in my opinion, three and four. However, you guys order them. Um, I've got Edward Solaire a bit higher, but I think that's a bit bold. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm very confident in myself when I'm saying that, but I think these guys is whichever you prefer, and they really have very similar profiles in terms of what they can do. Now, I think you mentioned the Rams for Jonathan Taylor, and I'm going to mention the Rams for J.K. Dobbins. I think his, his vision out there and, and the way he can complement to a Daryl Henderson potentially or a... I am Malcolm Brown. I'm, I'm kind of a fan of, but I hope he doesn't get too involved and and take snaps away from from Dobbins or Taylor year one. But 
I really think they're compl- complementary, and and I think it would be a good landing spot for him. The same way Taylor could be a good landing spot for them. I just I find them very comparable. Yeah, Dobbins is interesting to me. Um, I mean, Ohio State, all they do is just churn out uh, offensive juggernaut players and defense. I mean, just football oh, yeah. juggernauts. But, you know, again, this is a, another Doak Walker finalist for last year. Um, you know, hey, was- junior coming out, he's he's not a real big guy. Um, you know, only five nine. But he plays physical. He does. He is. He's a very physical back for his size. Um, so I, I think that that's gonna that's gonna help him. Uh, you know his his ability to to have that toughness will will and, help and, carry over. And and what he has over the the other two that we mentioned in terms of Swift and Taylor is that ball security. I think the other like Swift has fumbled it like fifteen times. No, 13 times or something like that. And and Swift has, and uh, Taylor has fumbled it 15 times over his whole career, which is about, I think, if we take the average, like 60, 60 carries a fumble in terms of ratio. It is a high fumble ratio if, if we're talking evaluation in, in the value, evaluation point of view. And and J.K. Dobbins is on the opposite side of the spectrum. So in terms of fantasy, in terms of losing two points of fumble type of thing, I think this guy, it's a secure investment in terms of not losing the football. And you can see it in the way he carries it. He's got those constant six point six points on the football. It's high up. It's tight. It's to the chest. It's something you love to see in terms of a, of a rookie prospect and something you won't have to teach him once he gets there. Yeah. Any thoughts on Dobbins, Joe? I mean, again, anybody going to L.A., I think at this point, is just walking into a starting role. Uh, we we saw what Henderson and and company did there after Gurley went down and or missed time and it's not good. So uh, I I love the move, but let's move on here to you guys uh, to to your boy Clyde Edwards Hilaire, LSU hey, running back my guy, your guy, man. Hey, hey, I'm not I'm not gonna deny it. I, I he, dude, talented guy. Obviously had had a great great one year. Uh, and sometimes that's all you need. Dude, that sometimes that's all you need. You just need that one chance, and then be like, "Peace, I'm going to the NFL, and I'm going to dominate." Um, it's happened. So, it's- what what are we doing with this guy, man? Like, is he legit? Like, tell us why he's your number two. It's unbelievable. How, why? How? And why would you start Nick Broset above this guy? In for most of 2018. Now, I get that for goal line situations, maybe bro said in college was better, but ain't like yeah, this guy's vision and the way he cerebrally IQ was just pros, processes things from the mesh point. He sets up defenders when he presses the line. He can shoot into gaps off a quick. He's got he's got such good step cadence that he can make quick cuts into where he wants to go. His vision, he's so quick to process thing. Lateral agility wise, he makes quick, quick, quick moves. And I mean like spin moves, he's got he's got one step cuts, he's got jump cuts, he's got everything to his arsenal. His cadence allows him to sequence moves. Now the one thing he'd be missing is maybe breakaway speed, and I think too many people are knocking him for that, and too many people overvalue the forty at the combine. He's got a great ten yard split. He this guy was blazing off the first ten yards. This guy was getting off his stance. I mean, there's a lot to like about J.K. Uh, J.K. I'm sorry, Clyde edwards Hilaire. and I don't understand the hate that's coming. Like, I think he's just getting over overshadowed by the people that are by by J- uh, Jonathan Taylor and J.K. Dobbins and and the stars of this draft. I think and DeAndre Swift. But I think this guy really, in terms of translation to the pros, he's the best at what he does. He's powerful. He finishes forward. I don't think he, there's anything that that is a reason a legitimate reason to limit his production at the pros and my best projection for him is is the buccaneers because of his pass catching ability he's so good out of the backfield his routes are polished he doesn't tilt where he's going to go he, his breaks his sharp breaks he, he he's so springy out of them he, he's just so refined he caught okay you want an interesting stat he caught more passes 
than Jalen Rager and Henry Ruggs, two top wide receiver prospects in the draft. Now, this guy is as productive as it gets out of the backfield for a guy like Tom Brady who likes who likes to go to, to the James Whites, who likes to go to his pass-catching backs. I think it's a perfect fit, and you're giving him someone that's very, very, like in terms of, of IQ, very ready to process pro schemes and process gaps and, and be patient behind his line. You're giving him a, a gift in terms of welcome to, to Tampa Bay. Now, they don't have to make this pick round one, but they can make it round two and would make Tom Brady very happy. What do you guys think? The only thing I would say about this, and I, and I, and I agree uh, that Tampa Bay is a good fit for this, is that he has to be able to pass protect. If you cannot pass protect Tom Brady, you are not on the field. Tom Brady will go over the coach and say, get this asshole off the field right now. <laughs> he will, He's already he's said he's done average. it numerous, numerous, numerous times. I think he's got a natural leverage. He's pretty short. He's got good knee bend. I think he I'm not saying he doesn't. Do it I'm a just lot. saying. Okay, here's the thing. He hasn't asked to do it a lot. He hasn't been asked to do it a lot with LSU because he was so often spread out wide on right. third downs and went when it was when it was down to, to passing situations. But I think it's something you can develop out of him. It's tough to project because we haven't seen it very often, but I wouldn't write him off for it because he's so in terms of IQ and the way he processes blocks and the way he understands I think he could understand pass blocking schemes and, and he can get good awareness and instincts in terms of his poise, just his poise behind the, behind the line. I think it could translate to pass blocking. Yeah. I, I think he's an interesting, interesting pick. Um, I mean, he was, he was huge last year in that national championship run for, for LSU. And, you know, every time I was watching one of their games, he was the guy. I mean, aside from Burrow, obviously, but he was the guy that just just killed it out of the backfield. And and I get what you're saying too. I, I agree. Like he doesn't have crazy breakaway speed, but if he gets enough of a jump, which he can, then his 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 tracking is is still solid. And I do like the Tampa Bay fit for him as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, as long as he can pass protect, um, you know, his lower center, center of gravity will help him with that, you know, just to, to just get up and get under guys. Um, and he's definitely a very short back, but, you know, he's powerful. Um, so I think he can use that to his advantage. And, and it's something that, if Tampa does go out and and get him, you know, with their with their first pick, I or think second. it's something that they'd have to look at. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, he could he could easily dip in because they're they're at fourteen in the first round, so might be a little early for him. Yeah, so. I, ha- I had him at fourteen in my mock draft, but that's that was more of a thing to make it make a statement, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to make a statement type of thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or they they could always trade back from fourteen if if they you know if the picks get in around 11, 11 12 and he's still sitting there because I, I don't really see the Jets going after him. I don't really see the Raiders going after him. Definitely. Um, and we've already talked about the Niners and they're you know, plethora of, of backs that they have there. So, you know, I, I think it, it could be a potential fit for them to drop back a couple picks and, and trade, trade down to still try to nab him in the first round if they think that he'll sit. So interesting pick for sure. So the last guy that we've got listed here is Cam Akers from Florida State. Um, I, to me, he, he's kind of similar to, uh, Edwards Allaire, um, you know, speed wise and, and split wise. Um, he's even height wise. I mean, he's, he's about three inches taller, so that helps, but he's still on the shorter side. Um, but he's, he's a bulky back. So what are your thoughts on acres? I, I think he runs a lot harder than his frame would indicate. I think he's a very physical back. Um, I do think he's faster than Alaire as well in terms of breakaway and home run potential. Um, I do what a main issue. He's a tough evaluation because he ran be- behind a very bad offensive line. It, it made him get over eager to bounce out. Uh, the question is, 
projecting him to a pro O-line with a more talented offensive line and someone that, that would really open gas for him, would he be too lack the patience to really lack the patience to really um stay stay press the line and 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 get into his gap set up second level defenders out of for his blockers out of the way so he can really hit that gap with decisiveness he's got the power he's got the burst to do it it's just he hasn't been asked to do it much um it, it, that is the biggest question with him I think why I why I hope he goes to Pittsburgh is because for one I really like um, John uh, Johnson uh, Connor I really like uh, James Connor I think he's got I think he's very powerful and I think Cam Akers is very complimentary in terms of the traits that he offers I think he's quick behind the line if he can if he can keep his feet down behind the line of scrimmage sometimes he he kind of hops around and 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 with his processing speed, his lower half gets kind of slow to react, but I think they're very complementary, and I think they can integrate acres in a way that stays productive and, and complementary to, to Connor that keeps Connor productive for fantasy and acres productive for fantasy in terms of giving Connor uh, acres, big, big uh, PPR PPR value and, and yard per carry value. And Connor can get those touchdowns. And I think, it, it kind of sells both sides of the equation here. What do you guys think? Yeah, you know, honestly, so Akers is one of these guys that I saw more often than not just from watching games because ACC, Virginia Tech ACC, fans yeah. here. Um, I wasn't super duper impressed with him, which is obviously why you've got him a little lower than everybody else. But, um, I mean, yeah, the this, this Steelers would be a good spot. You know, he can sit behind Connor and, and learn a little bit, and he obviously be the secondary guy. Um, I'll tell you, somebody that I'm kind of interested in that I know we had on like our, on our backup list that I think would be an interesting fit there too would be like A.J. Dillon, man. Like, I think this guy is getting undersold. Uh, like, no, AJ please Dillon? don't send Dillon there. No, please don't. Dude, A.J. Dillon dominates. Every freaking yeah, game I watch, power fucking back. He's not gonna. <laughs> he's 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 too much like like Connor. He I don't want him there. Like that's the one guy I was hoping you wouldn't send there. <laughs> maybe okay. So maybe not okay. But maybe not there. But I don't know, man. Okay, like, fine, I, not I, Dylan. So, I, but look, <laughs> I think, but I think Dylan is a legit better prospect. I'm a huge Dylan fan. I'm a big time Dylan fan. But Dylan not to this destroyed. Dylan every awesome. defense I ever saw him face, man. Like, if it wasn't for he the crappy Boston, around. He, if it wasn't okay, for the crappy the Boston College here's offense, he would be amazing. I would, I would love Dylan, Dylan to the Steelers, but he, he would not Connor out of a job. He, that's the fine. Who cares? That's fine, <laughs> right? If he's Connor, better than Connor, Connor, he's better did than Connor. Not Bell out of a job. Oh wait, no, well, never mind. Bell did that to himself, <laughs> and Connor just excelled, so he took the job. Uh, you know, and literally ran with it. But uh, Connor didn't really run with it last year. I mean, he was he got injured a lot of the, the year, and... so that that didn't help things. But when he was healthy, he still looked like shit. Um, I mean, so I, I think you know they they don't have a lot behind them. I think they. I think they like Benny Snell, and and I do too. But I, yeah. I so okay. he's not going to be a workhorse guy, though. He's not. No, he's not. He's not AJ Dillon. Um, no, AJ Dillon's a beast. Nobody dude. is AJ Dillon. AJ Dillon is a unicorn in terms yeah. of, of running back. In terms it's of so crazy. Back and, and how, <laughs> right? He's I'm like glad Bettis, you're a fan man. Of AJ Dillon, because I'm a big AJ Dillon fan. I hated him. In- I've hated him for the last three years. So let me tell you. <laughs> But uh, let's go. Let's now go. that he's let's gone, I here. love him. <laughs> yeah. Now Don't have to worry about his ass. Every time AC Boston College gets on the, the schedule, I just go, fans. damn. We got to oh, we gotta tackle A.J. Dillon Joe for a whole Bond, game. Joe Bond is a, is an A.J. Dillon fan. I'm, I'm glad we got another one, another <laughs> one in the club. Uh, I've watched too many ACC games. I've watched him just roll over people the entire game. Um, But... All right, let's move on to the wide receivers here. Um, this is the last position we're going to cover. Tight ends are very bad. Volatile. So, um, so my my wide receiver needy teams are Packers, Eagles, Vikings, Broncos. I'm still going to throw in the Rams and the Texans. Um, 
I mean, the Rams now, because they got rid of Cook, so maybe they're going to look for another speed guy. Um, and then the Texans, just because maybe they – I don't think they're going to go reach for any of these like early guys that we're going to talk about today. But I think they could go for somebody later, uh, like a slot guy or somebody like that. Like um, like a Van Jefferson? No. <clears throat> maybe. Uh, we're not going to talk about him today, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of guys going late. There's tons of receivers in this draft. And unfortunately, you know, we're, we're already at an hour 20, so we're going to have to rip through these, but, but yeah, like we gotta, you know, we're going to go through the top five. Uh, we can't go into the top 10. Like we would have loved to do with the, the we're not going to do that. No, it would be a three hour show, but yeah. Let's start off with the top guy here, and that is Jerry Judy, Alabama wide receiver. Give it and to us, man. This guy doesn't need a ton of time, man. Just nah, <laughs> a tremendous. Uh, honestly, I don't know if you guys saw the last highlight of him, the the leaking thing on on Twitter where he he used a fake throw by on Trayvon Diggs at, at practice. He's just nasty route running, man, man to man. He just creates separation out of his break so easily from release to stem to break. It's just he doesn't need an introduction. He's he's as easy of an evaluation you're going to get from the wide receiver spot. And to me, it's kind of crazy that some people have C.D. Lamb ahead of him. To me, that's a projection. Um, I think I think Judy is as polished as it gets getting out and beating man covered just like Amari Cooper just like Stefan Diggs is right now in the NFL he does things that are better than many NFL wide receivers right now so throw him in any offense he'll succeed now the best offense for him the Denver Broncos he'll be playing opposite Cortland Sutton with a great quarterback and Drew Locke he'll have an underneath guy in in no offense he's someone he can produce right away and I dare you to I dare you to play man on him. I dare you to press press on him. I dare you to, to try and jam him at the line. He's too quick. You will not get him. He will get into your blind spot. He will break with spring separation. He's gone. Throw him the ball. My one downside on him. We and I'm nitpicking. What about contested catches? He has not faced a single <laughs> contested catch situation in practice in practice or in games. We don't know if he's good at them. We don't need to know. He's, that's like it's insane. Uh, what do you guys think about Judy? <laughs> Judy's a beast. Uh, yeah. I mean, this guy is, I don't want to say far and away the top receiver in this draft, but he, he's definitely the top pick in my mind. It's close between him and CD Lamb, but I would still lean Judy. Um, I mean, you, just, you can't go wrong with this guy. I mean, everything he does is production you know i mean just the guy the guy's amazing i mean i I watched an interview with him uh just before the podcast actually on on uh nfl network they were talking draft stuff and had him on the show and and he was he was you know a polished speaker i felt like too you know he wasn't just you know for lack of better words a a goon so to speak and and you know he he just seems very bright he he's he understands the game he is a student of the game yet excels at this game as well so i mean he's fast he's got great hands i I don't know what's not to like about this guy so that's that's all i need to say about it yeah i i agree with all of that um i think another interesting spot i'm not sure is ideal more than denver but I mean, I think Philly or Green Bay at yeah. this point would be awesome for him. And then, of course, they'd have to trade up. Right. I mean, look, I, I'm not saying realistic because of where they're drafting, but I'm saying ideal. Right. I mean, and that's what yeah. this was supposed to be. Right. It's supposed to be, hey, if he could land anywhere, throw him there in Rodgers. Let's see what he could do. Oh, right. Man. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll put Carson Wentz with him. I'll, I'll even put please. him on the Vikings over Denver, you know, like please trade up and go and get him. If you ask me somebody like, like those problem. teams, the Packers, the one thing they absolutely besides O-line because they cannot keep Aaron Rodgers healthy. 
freaking receivers, dude. They can't find their second receiver for the last three years, it seems like. So it's yeah. uh, it, it, any of these guys that we're talking about, I'm going to mention the Packers. So I'm just going to give it away now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would Spoiler love, alert. <laughs> I would love for him to be wearing – you know, Kelly Green, if the Eagles can manage a way to bring that jersey back. Um, but he, either, hey, you know, either the green and black is, is fine. But, you know, them I, sitting I was, at 21, they absolutely I, would have to move up. I was I was doing a mock for, for Joe, John, is it Joe or John? Oh, my God, I didn't reverse. For, I didn't rehearse for this. It, it might be John Lobb. I did John Lobb's website. I think it's footballdiehards.com. And I had, I had the Broncos pick. And the Eagles were negotiating to move up ahead of the Broncos to go and get Jerry Judy. So it is As something that is very it should be it should be envisionable for you. So absolutely it's something man. you should think about. I, I think they I think they need to work something with uh with Gruden and get up to that twelve spot and, and just just secure it. I mean, do what you need to, Roseman. I mean, hey, Oakland um, could be a, a spot for uh L- uh, yeah, I mean, Vegas. Oakland's not sorry, a spot Vegas, whatever. Uh, Vegas could be a spot for a receiver too. Honestly, I didn't even. I I left them off. Like I said, if Oakland. I forgot one, guys, yell at me. <laughs> Oakland's up next. I, I'm I'm just saying that. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, so speaking of next, speaking of next, let's let's talk about that that other receiver in the uh, maroon jersey, different team with Oklahoma though, Mr. C. D. Lamb. Um, I mean, this guy's just, he's phenomenal too. I mean, Bolitnikov yeah. finalist last year. Um, it, he's, he's got everything you need. Uh, he's not, uh, he's still fast. He's not the fastest guy, but you know, four, five, 40 is not bad, but a one forty six in the 10 yard split. Yeah. He, that's, he gets that's off the nice line. Get fast. Up and go. That's the thing. So he's got a great burst off the release. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's a physical guy. Um, he's just a, a massive competitor. You know, he played played in a great offensive scheme. What do you what do you like and or dislike about Lamb? If there's anything to dislike, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> no, the the my top my the the top trait that I value the most in Lamb is. Man, he's a monster after the catch. The ambush situations he finds himself in and the and the stuff he gets out of is unreal. Sometimes he's surrounded by like, and I'm not exaggerating, seven defenders. And we know there's 11 players on a football field. This guy has seven defenders around him. He's still finding his way to, in, to the end zone with elusiveness, power, physicality. He will lower his pads. He'll bounce off, and he will go. He's got stop and start quickness. He is unreal after the catch. He will reel that catch in, first of all, with a lot of safety and secure, like he's secure, he's a secure catcher. He's got great hands, whether that be a high point ball, he's going to go up 50, 50. He's going to whatever situation it is. And then he's just going to go and take it to the house in terms of college production. He's as, as great as it is in terms of taking it to the house, no matter the situation. He's unbelievable. Now, the one production, the one thing he has to improve and polish out is his routing. He's very, very instinctive when it comes to zone coverage. But against man, he loses a bit of time at, 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 in press coverage. He tries to beat out the guy with quickness. It takes a bit of time and it, it disrupts his timing. In, in Oklahoma, he gets away with it because Lincoln Rowley gives him massive windows to work with. And, and, and Jalen Hurst isn't the quickest guy to unleash the ball. But in the NFL, in a in a timing and, and rhythm-based offense, especially with the team I've, I've, I've mocked him to and the team that I think he'll be better in in terms of Oakland, the Raiders, he's going to have to iron that out. Now, he doesn't have to take that role early with the Raiders. He can be an X receiver. He can work off the line and just get a free release. And, man, the production they're going to give him in that offense in terms of getting the ball quickly and making plays after the catch, I think your fantasy, he's a hit, man. And that body control and jump ball ability in the red zone and the end zone, I think you guys have probably seen that play in, in at the combine, the way he just goes up and twirls. He's going on air, but just that body control in the air to get both feet down at the combine, that was insane. That type of ability, man, what do you guys think? Like, fuck. Like, 
<laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. I didn't I didn't get the chance to watch the combines, but um I obviously that 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 play was shown a lot. Yeah, it's incredible. The the biggest worry for me, man, it's just it's Oklahoma, man. It's that offense, it's that spread super system. It's almost like what you said with with uh um Herbert, right? In 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 Oregon, right? It's just is it too much system? And you know, we we've seen a lot of these Oklahoma wide receivers get hyped up a lot. It feels like, um, and the, and they don't quite pan out the way you thought, um, or hoped. So that's the one thing I worry about. CD Lamb, I think he's more talented than some of the guys that have come out from from them lately. Just as far as like I think a, he's way more talented than Hollywood Brown. If that's what you like, yeah, yeah. I mean. He he's one. I mean, there's just a, a lot of guys. I mean, way Sterling more. Shepard has been one. Dee Dee Westbrook was way one. more than Sterling Shepard. Yeah, more obviously, than but I just tons of these guys, man. They come out of these like super spread systems. And I've evaluated. I always worry those guys. He's I always more, worry about these more. guys. So I don't know. I, we'll we'll see, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I I'm hesitant. Take some time because I do agree with you is that in that system, in the Big 12, he hasn't ha- he hasn't been asked to create as much separation off men because of the level of competition he's been facing. The defense is and that's trash. something that's <laughs> something real. he's gonna have to that's something he's gonna have to adjust to in the NFL. And that's why I have him lower than than Judy because Judy is ready to have that yes. impact. And I think Lem might take a bit more time, but in terms of ceiling, in terms of even in terms of floor, he's he's very safe of a prospect, and you can put him in a situation to succeed, especially with Gruden at the hell. I think he knows how to put this guy into into a situation to succeed, and I just trust that fit in terms of Lamb at the next level. I just trust it. I, I'm not too afraid of that pick. Yeah, and I mean it's funny because you know we mentioned the player profiler. Comp, you know, Jerry Rice. Jerry he's, Rice. He's That's ca- a bit too maybe, high for me. <laughs> maybe he's – hey, Gruden's coached both, right? So let's do it. That is that is it. <laughs> so random, random question then. What happens if Arizona decides? Oh, man. No way. Jump. That would be nasty. No way would they do that. They so just got Hopkins. Man. Why would they do it? that? Okay. Why wouldn't they do that? Because Are you of kidding Tyler me? Tyler Murray and his connection no, with CD Lamb. No, no, no. Yo, I know that they have AJ. Hopkins now, so it's it's less waste. Like it's called that. a wasted AJ. pick. That's why. What's that? Hey, do you the, the biggest comp getting thrown around with CD Lamb right now is DeAndre Hopkins, and you're telling me you want to throw DeAndre Hopkins and say, that is. Filthy. That is that would be insane. I mean, I would we're talking like Madden it. level production here, but yeah, sure. It'd be fun, <laughs> but it ain't gonna happen. Like realistically, that is not happening. It would be the wrong choice as well. In terms of team building, it would not Oh, they be absolutely the need yeah, yeah, they need a in whole lot building, more. I I hundred percent agree. But and that that was more of a, you know, pre DeAndre Hopkins trade. Of course. Oh, that was like the biggest Land landing spot, spot for him I before was Hopkins. All over, and then it was like uh, all right. Now they don't necessarily need to do this. No, definitely but not. I'd be fine with him falling back to twenty one for the Eagles too. So <laughs> hey. anybody to the Eagles, right? You just Moving need receivers. <laughs> <laughs> I should have wore my Eagles shirt. <laughs> Whatever. Scott Fishbowl love. We love it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, all right. So next here up we've got Henry Ruggs. Uh, Alabama wide receiver. This guy, just another Alabama product, man. He's just top notch. Uh, what we got? All right. Well, I want to warn people with Henry Ruggs. Okay. This guy's a pure projection guy. And if he gets drafted in the first round, just like John Ross, it'll be purely off projection. Tremendous athlete. He can go up, leap, make catches. He's got a humongous speed. Game breaking speed, four two seven speed. That doesn't need to be mentioned, but in terms of route polish, his ability to get in breaks, and even his creativity after the catch. Unless he's got an open lane, I've been pretty disappointed. Now, I haven't watched every game from him, but uh, I'll be very careful with him. Now, the athletic ability, he can definitely work on and 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 develop into a nice receiver. There's, but there's a lot to be careful with. 
in terms of in terms of what he can do now my best fit with it was for him sorry about that was the 49ers the 49ers with yes. Cal Shanahan they have Debo Samuel on one side probably in the slot I thought Debo Samuel had ability to uh, widen out at X or Z uh once once he polishes up I think now is the time for him to do that I think he's got a year to develop now they can have they can have um rugs in there as as an as a X factor type of guy as a gadget type of guy, and I would love to see what a what a creative play caller like Shanahan can do with Rugs in there. So I think that that would be so fun to think about, uh, just in terms of the athletic ability and what he would do with him. Even though he's not polished, kind of like what they did with Tyree Kill when he was when when he wasn't ready to play as a as an X receiver, the screens, the kick return game. I think that's what they could do with Rugs. What do you guys think? I- it's so funny you say that because uh, player profiler and, and we're not we're not getting paid to talk about them a lot, but I, I love this site. I love the the stats and everything they give uh, for these for these players. The cop they have is Marquise Goodwin. <laughs> oh like, wow! Okay, it's almost like they have him that. already. They don't know it, right? <laughs> so yeah, and they, I they think he's better than Goodwin. Honestly, last year, I hope he's better than Goodwin. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah go with flopped pretty hard. Definitely did. Um, I I like Ruggs. I, I mean, I I think he's. I don't want to say underrated, but I think he's he's like, kind of the the forgotten guy, with all the hype that Judy gets. But I mean, Alabama was such a powerhouse team for the last what I don't know four decades. I feel like. Um, not necessarily that long, but I mean, it's again, another, another team that just churns out talent after talent after talent. You know, he's not the tallest guy, um, but you know, he's, he's got, he's got the ability and, and he's got some big play ability with, with being physical. Um, I think that, that he does need some more polishing. So I think going to a, a, a team where he can kind of not necessarily have to be a, a big go-to guy would be would be better to start. So I, I like the San Fran pick. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Joe? No, I, like I said, I, I think it's a I think it's a great landing spot for him. They they are kind of a, a wide receiver needy team, honestly. So it's good. Just get him in, get him in space and make him make a plays. So. Yeah. Moving right. on. So the next guy we got here is T. Higgins from uh, Clemson. Um, this is a guy that I actually saw was projected to go to Philly. So that was kind of interesting to see. Um, I, I mean, he's he's pretty low. You know, you've got him at wide receiver 11 on your on your big board here. So. What are your what are your thoughts on him? I mean, he's obviously a little farther down. Do you think he's someone that should should fall well past Philly and and out of the first round? I mean, you've got him as a round two rank. So yeah, I think I think uh, Higgins is a tough evaluation because a lot of oh, wait, sorry, yeah. I I turned down my bike. I'm sorry about that. I think Higgins is a tough evaluation. Turn it down. Turn it down. Turn it down. It's too loud now. <laughs> Sorry. It was that, like guys. scratchy. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. Uh, anyways, I think Higgins is a tough evaluation because um, a lot of what he does doesn't. I think first of, in 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 the first part, I think Philly fans are going to be very afraid when they see Higgins in terms of what JJR say what side was doing um, this year. Um, <laughs> I, I see you nodding your head in, in the me. wrong way, for, <laughs> but yeah, give or give one side drink. They didn't give, give him a chance, man. That dude is phenomenal. I'm still a believer. No, I I do like white side. I, I I like his upside. But what I think what could knock Higgins out of the first round is is that pro day. For one, he didn't participate in the combine. Brought up some injury issue that came up late. Um. And at the combine, that vertical jump is the biggest worry because the biggest highlight I had of him off of tape was that high point ability, yeah. the ability to make that make big plays deep and and play in the red zone. And 
And that just didn't translate to what we saw at, the, at his pro day in terms of a 40 time. And that, it's kind of a concern for me now. His route running and I think his release is very underrated. He did get skinny against press. He does play with his hands. He can release pretty well. Um, his stem manipulation against men is, leaves a bit to be envied. He's not very physical. We've seen him struggle against Okuda in the in the semifinals and college semifinals. Um, but it, it, it's it, his double moves vertically are are interesting. It's just to me, it's a it's a big time projection, and I don't have as much confidence as the other guys in the draft, which is why I have him at eleven. Now it's still a second round grade because he's very good at what he does, and if they use him in that way, he can still be very successful. I just struggle in terms of confidence with 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 um Higgins now. He does have the traits to eventually become a number one wide receiver if he can develop. I don't think. I, those hard breaks, he's not very flexible. He doesn't really sink into them, but it's a big-time projection. Um, my fit for Higgins was the Bills because they need a big body. Even after trading for Diggs, they need someone that to be that big target, make plays down the field, be a 50-50 target, be someone that can go up and make plays in the red zone. They just don't have that outside of Dawson Knox, and having someone on the outside like that would be a good fit, and he could be productive in that offense with with Josh Allen uh, throwing oh. throwing the football. What do you think? Whenever Josh Allen decides he's going to throw one out of three on target, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. I don't love the Bills as a landing spot. I, I would love to see Higgins go somewhere like I I mean hell like and I, and I know I, I kind of spoiled it early like the Packers like maybe the Packers are the good spot but maybe like Rodgers could teach him how to run some routes and be physical and stuff like that Um, the Vikings kind of need a guy like this too right I mean like Thielen's kind of a kind of a downfield guy even though most people don't think he is but he is more downfield than you think T Higgins doesn't need to be that guy yeah. at this point Uh, I mean well it's interesting. I don't know. There, there's... I struggle uh, if, with the Vikings. What you would ask out of T. Higgins is work over the middle, and I just don't see that from. Him. I don't. I don't see him being able to make those hard breaks on dig routes. He can do. He can. He can work the shallow cross. He can work the over. The over, but. It, it's just not utilizing him to the best potential. I want to see double. I want to see DK Metcalf usage from him. That's how he could succeed. That's how he can succeed, in my opinion. Uh, I think, I think, Indy could be an interesting spot for him. Oh He's yeah, so yeah. many With second. Rivers. I mean, in my it, opinion, Indy's got too many second year, third year receivers that are like poised to break out. And I feel like the Paris Campbell, Campbell does not really eat into that, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I like what Pascal did in in his opportunities last year, filling in as the number one for uh, T.Y. Hilton. But you know, we've got to assume that Hilton's going to come back healthy, so he's going to be back to being no. the number one. And I, I just think he'd be a good complimentary guy there. I mean, with Rivers, oh, I agree. Rivers likes to throw the ball. You know, he likes his little dump downs to the to the running backs, but I just I think that th this could be a fit for them. You know, not that they're necessarily receiver needy, but I I don't know oh. if I really see Higgins as a first rounder. Either. I really yeah, no, same, I don't think he, I, don't think I really like either. that that Colts fit because I think he could really take on that Mike Williams type type of role that that yeah. um that that he had over with the Chargers. I, I like that fit. That's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, he had Keenan Allen as the main guy, so you've got Hilton now. Um, you know, he had Williams, too, as as his, like, super deep threat. So maybe you throw a Campbell or, or a Pascal into that if you don't want to stretch T.Y. too much. So I, I that's, that's kind of my thought on it. But... Hmm. No, I mean... I don't hate it. I just, at the same time, I'm just kind of like, yeah. I just feel like there's there's a lot there, and I think they're waiting. I think they're just looking for Campbell or somebody to to be a second guy. Um. So all right, let's move on to the last guy we've got here, and it's Justin Jefferson, LSU. So we start with LSU. We're gonna end with LSU. Uh 
give us give us your breakdown of this guy, man. Now Jefferson Jefferson's a very pro ready receiver in my opinion. Now it depends on the scheme you're gonna get him in, and I think the Vikings can really do that for him. I think he's his releases off press need work in terms of hand usage and physicality in route. But if you stack him behind a tight end, if you put him in the slot and let him release off a just give him a free release, let him work into space. He is so instinctive and sharp out of his breaks and just a instinctive route runner. He's so polished in that aspect. He can have an immediate impact. And and you're talking about a quarterback that works off play action, that loves yes. getting his receivers out on press. This is a perfect fit, fit in my opinion. It's, it's just for fantasy, for real football, this is someone they might actually go after round one. And this is someone I'm confident in terms of if I was – to put a bet on a landing spot, this is somewhere I would put Jefferson for. Um, he's not a route, a Stefan Dix type route runner, but he can take up some of that production, give uh, Adam Thielen some of that one on one production on the outside, and give him because Ste- uh, Adam Thielen's a really good route runner. He can really beat Matt coverage. Give him some of that freedom. Let uh, Justin Jefferson work off in in in, th- in third down situations. He's very productive on third downs. I think this is a perfect fit for this offense. You still have Dalvin Cook. You got Irv Smith that can still get a ton of production in this offense. This is a perfect fit for everybody, in my opinion. What do you guys think? I I like it, man. I really do. AJ, what do you what are you feeling? Yeah, I mean, he goes from wearing purple and and gold to wearing purple and gold. <laughs> so that works. There's too, already a fit there. Um, but I, I would not be disappointed if the Eagles sniped him at 21, uh, you and the Eagles, man, stop being, stop being so greedy. Okay. Okay. I'm not being greedy. It's not just about you going after what we need. Not just about you. You've said every receiver you want. All right. I'm just just giving you a hard time. I do. do. If if you were to sum up this podcast, it's like perfect landing spots for everyone is the Eagles. Yeah. So and the Eagles are so thin at receiver. Of course. So yeah, I mean, I said the big two landing spots was Packers and Eagles, so that was a obvious. But I want to point out, by the way, got to plug him one more time. Player profile. You talked about being smart, has great hands. You know, can get off the snap pretty well, right? All that kind of stuff. Their comp, Reggie Wayne. Oh wow, that's that is incredible. When you said all of that, and then I saw Reggie Wayne, I went, "Wow!" Like that's, yeah, like that's pretty much everything you said. (laughs) So that's not that bad, but I yeah. So I I don't know what they mean with comps though. Is it a ceiling thing? Is it a playing style? It's it's always very confusing. It is, it is, but I I think it's I think it's uh, pretty interesting, you know. ah! I hate we need to, to start talking about like instincts players, and like, things like that. Like that's Reggie ceiling. Wayne to me. Talk about good hands, instinct, okay, yeah. body control, route savvy. Like that's Reggie Wayne to me. That's fair, yeah. So no, that's that's, that's where point. like when you as soon as you said all those things and I saw that comp, I was like, man, spot on. Like that's Reggie Wayne. So interesting to say that. So all right, man. Well, let's still, let's oh, end. Got- Sorry, what? You wanted to say one I more thing? Still got some thi- I still think he's got some things to polish if he's going to lie oh, about course, that. Oh, of course. Of course. Productive as Reggie Wayne. But yeah. Of course. <laughs> no one's going to come out of college right away and just be like, yeah, I'm that good. No, that's like yeah. that's like the projection. In my opinion, the way they're doing their comps is like that's, a, that's like a projection comp. Or like a It's like a best value comp type of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do not in any – way you think he's going to come out year one and look like Reggie Wayne. That'd be insane. Oh, no. I don't expect you to think that as well. So, All right, man. Well, let's end it there. Great show. This is phenomenal information. I, I love this talking on this stuff with you, man. Uh, remind everybody where they can find you on Twitter, Instagram, and, and everything you got going on, man. Yep. Well, you can find me on Twitter at at, in, at Selian underscore FB. Selian is S E L Y A N underscore FB. And I started this little brand going uh, inside the five scouting where I post a bunch of, of clips from my film sessions, anything, anything I want to share on uh, players. I like little blurbs on, on the tapes I see. So on Instagram, that's on Instagram. That's where I share most of my films. So um, yeah, just follow me on there and I got a draft guide coming out and you can find out on Twitter. So, yep. 
Good stuff, man. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. It was a blast talking about it. I know it was a little longer than our normal shows, guys, but appreciate it if you guys hung out. Uh, right. I hope this helped you guys, you know, for your rookie drafts coming up and things like that. So I know it did for me. Uh, AJ, you got anything to close out with? I mean, all, all fantastic information. So thanks again for coming on. All right, man. See you then. We will, uh, we will talk to you later, man. Have a good night. Yep. All right, AJ, we're uh, I think we'll just we'll just call it a call it a night with this, man. What do you think? <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, exactly. I finished both my beers. Down so. the tubes. <laughs> See ya, man.